Uh, my wife tells the story when she was a little girl of her paternal grandfather. I'm sorry the screen isn't working. We'll get that fixed for next week, but you'll see a picture of him here on this screen. That's uh, Douglas Johnston, my wife's uh, grandfather on her father's side. He pitched in the Cardinals organization with Dizzy Dean under uh, manager Blanche Rickey. He was an Olympic alternate wrestler. He was a Baptist pastor for 57 years. The patriarch of the family, he was instrumental in my understanding of my own calling and encouraging me to go into ministry. But my, and he really a remarkable man. Tall, six foot six, dark uh, eyes and low, uh, powerful voice. Kind of an intimidating figure, but I knew him as a very kind and encouraging man. But my wife tells a story when she was a little girl, she was both fascinated and terrified by her, her grandfather. He, he would speak kind of low to her, and she and her sisters would peer around the corner, and if he was coming, they would try to avoid him because he scared them. I don't think he meant to. It's a very kind man, but they misunderstood their grandpa because he was kind of an intimidating guy. I think many of us have views of God that are somewhat like that. We're fascinated by him, but a little bit scared, a little bit uneasy, a little bit nervous where we stand. God is... I've talked to people who see him as a stern, mysterious figure. We hear about his love, but to us, he seems far off, distant, and not close, certainly not approachable. C.S. Lewis described how he, he used to view God in this way on the evening of his fir first beginning of his conversion. He said, you must picture me alone in that room, his rooms at Magdalen College in Oxford. Night after night, feeling whenever my mind lifted even for a second from my work, the steady, unrelenting approach of him whom I so desperately desired not to meet. That which I greatly feared had at last come upon me. Talks about how he was thinking his way to the realization that there is a God, but didn't want to admit it, and was feeling the approach of faith. And it made him uneasy at first. I think many of us can relate to that. The passage we're going to look at here at the end of Hebrews chapter 4, and if you're new, we're in a series called Jesus is Greater. Actually, Jesus with the greater than sign, in case you've forgotten what that little arrow means. Uh, how he's greater than anything else we could face in our lives. How there's nothing in your life or in the universe that's greater than Jesus. And we're looking now at a really an interesting three verses at the very end of Hebrews chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Hebrews 4. We'll read verses 14 through 16, or you can follow along on the one screen. Hebrews 4, 14. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. These three verses are remarkable. There, there's so much packed in here. In, in chapter 1 we read about Jesus being the greater word and greater than the universe, greater than all creation because he created all that exists and he holds all things together by a word of his power. In chapter 2 we find out that Jesus is greater than the angels, than all the heavenly beings. They do his will. He is greater. In chapter 3, we find out Jesus is greater than Moses, than Israel's greatest leader, the one who delivered his people out of bondage and slavery in Egypt. Jesus is greater than Moses. And here in chapter 4, we find out he's our greater high priest. A greater high priest. The word for high priest is the word in Greek, it's uh, archiarius. It, it, it occurs only uh, 17 times, only in the Gospels and in Hebrews, and it's 17 times out of the 30 times it's used, are in he on the book of Hebrews. Now, when it's used in the Gospels, it's often referring to a, a human earthly high priest who very, in, in, later in the Gospels, opposes Jesus and his mission. But in Hebrews, it's used differently. In the Old Testament, the, term, the terms chief priest and high priest are interchangeable, but in the New Testament, you might read your Gospels and find out there are the chief priests and then the high priest. Throughout the first three chapters of Hebrews, the author has been referencing the role of Jesus as our great high priest, but he's been sort of cryptic about it. He hasn't explained what that role specifically is. 
you, know, you look back to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. But he's not, we're not exactly told how that works. And here in chapter 4, we're getting more insight into what that role is and why it matters to us. He gets specific. He names Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, is our great high priest. And he explains how he functions. Now, as Protestants and as Baptists, we, we don't think much about priests. We think about the Roman Catholicism, and we think, you know, hey, we don't have priests. There's one mediator between God and man. We need to need his word and ourselves. And I, I think we need to understand the Jewish Hebrew view of the high priest in order to understand what's being told to us about who Jesus is to us today. These Jewish believers, and remember, Hebrews is written to a group of Jewish con- converts to Christianity. They, they, were, they grew up Jewish, and they have converted to faith in Jesus Christ. And because of oppression and hardship in the first century for their faith, they are considering wavering and thinking of going back to the old, their old ways in Judaism. The Hebrews is written to say, essentially, why would you go back when Jesus is greater? So when he says he's the greater high priest, that is significant to them. The, the Levitical priesthood, these were the descendants of Aaron, the divinely appointed mediators between God and his people. The Jews depended on their priests to do their jobs well, especially once a year at Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, where the only one person in in Judaism for the Israelites who could enter into the Holy of Holies was the high priest, and he could only do so once a year. This was the day he entered there behind the curtain into the Holy of Holies, sprinkling the blood of the sacrifice on the altar, which is outside the Holy of Holies, on the, the tip, the horns, the place where the wings, the mercy seat, touched above the Ark of the Covenant in symbolic atonement for the sins of the people. And this had to happen every year because we'll learn later in the book of Hebrews that the blood of bulls and goats is not sufficient to take away sins. It's only symbolic of what's required. That's why in 2.17, we just read, Jesus is, it had to be made like his brothers and he would make propitiation, atonement, perfect sacrifice for sins. The priest, in other words, represents to God, the pe- represents God to the people. Let's re- look again at verses 14 through 15 of chapter 4. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. This phrase, passed through, this is day of atonement language. The Old Testament high priest, or even in Jesus' day, the high priest at the temple, would pass through the veil, the inner curtain, once a year to make atonement into the symbolic representation of the presence of God. Jesus, we're told, passes through the heavens. Now the Jews thought of the heavens in three layers. Perhaps you remember the Apostle Paul in in, the letter to the Corinthians where he talks about having, he was caught up in the third heaven. What does he mean by that? It's simpler than you might think. They, They viewed the sky as the first heaven, the stars and planetary movements as the second heaven, and the highest heaven, the third heaven, is the place where God himself dwelled. So when you read he passed through the heavens, Jesus pass through into the presence of God. The high priest would do what? Pass through the veil into the symbolic presence of God. Jesus passes through into the actual presence of God for us. He doesn't make symbolic sacrifices. He was the actual sacrifice. I think it's important also that we see, and I didn't really pay attention to this until this week, he says we have a great high priest You see, perhaps these Jewish believers were thinking, well, we're losing out on all that was promised in the Old Testament, all that was given to us in the law and the priesthood. Are we losing out on that? And the writer of Hebrews is saying, no, you're not. You're getting all that and more. You're getting something greater than that. Why? Because Jesus is not doing away with the priesthood. He is your high priest. 
He's my high priest. Think about that for a minute. He belongs to you if you have faith in Jesus Christ. He's yours. He intercedes for you. He goes between you and the Father. He carries you before the Father, your name, into the presence of the Father and mine. We have a great high priest. It's not abstract. It's not out there. It's not theoretical. It's you right now. If you have faith in Jesus Christ, have someone interceding for you constantly before the throne of grace. You have that. What a great promise. Charles Spurgeon writes this, All that Israel had under the law and the Levitical priesthood, we still retain fully in Christ. Only we have the substance of which they had just the shadow. Isn't that good? We have the substance, the real thing, of which they just had symbolic representation. This is why the writer of Hebrews is saying, don't go back to the shadow. Don't go back to the symbol. You have the substance, the great, true high priest. Exodus chapter 28, verse 29. It's an interesting passage about, actually it's specifically about the high priest's garments, but it will make an important, I think, application here. If I should have brought my readers. There it is. So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel in the breastpiece of judgment on his heart when he goes into the holy place to bring them to regular remembrance before the Lord. Now this sounds a little strange. Aaron, the, the, the high priest of Israel, the first, shall bring the names on the breastpiece of judgment into the Holy of Holies for constant remembrance before the Lord. What is that about? Well, have you ever seen drawings of, the, of a high priest, the priesthood? Maybe you've seen these in your, in your study Bibles or in uh, uh, different notes and so on. Uh, you'll see an image here of the high priest, uh, just an artist rendering. I, I don't know why their beards are always white, but apparently they either dyed them or had white beards. Um, but that, that breast piece there has 12 gemstones on, the, on it. On each of those stones is carved the name of one of the tribes of Israel, named for one of the sons, the 12 sons of Jacob. And on the shoulders are onyx stones on which also are engraved the names, six on one and six on the other. Why? Because when the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, it, symbolically, all the people of God, all that belonged to God, were gathered in that high priest. You were brought in, symbolically, into the presence of God. So that he would, like, symbolically remember the people constantly. Not that God needed to be reminded, but the people did. This is what you need, your, your sin needs. Someone to bring you before the Lord and make atonement for you. And to bring you constantly before the Lord. So when we read that Jesus passed through the heavens on our behalf, all who belong to him in Christ, are, we are, in a very real sense, gathered in. When Ephesians, which we'll study in the spring, the phrase in Christ is used over and over and over again. We are gathered together in him, and he brings us into the presence of the Father. That's what it means when he says he's our great high priest. Your name is written on his heart on his breastpiece of judgment, and he brings your name before God the Father and says, this one belongs to me. I have atoned for the sins of this one. This is my son. This is my daughter. They're my child. Isn't it, it's, this imagery to these Jewish believers in the first century would have been overwhelming to them. I think we miss it. We read it and it sounds like archaic Old Testament language but it's powerful. It exists for you and for me. This is what Jesus does for us. The children of Israel were gathered collectively, and so we are also gathered collectively in him. We'll read this later in the book of Hebrews. It won't be on the screen, but later in Hebrews, in chapter 7, verse 25, we'll, we'll come to this in a few weeks, but consequently, he, Jesus, is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. That's what he's doing for us constantly. So this is the reason the writer of Hebrews says to them to hold fast to their confession. So think about that. He says Jesus is our high priest and he has a heavenly responsibility. He's passed through the heavens. He brings you before the Father. You trust him. And then he says you have a job to do, an earthly responsibility. He has a heavenly role. His role is high priest. You have an earthly job. What's your earthly job? Hold fast 
your confession. What does that mean? The Greek word there for hold fast is it's the word kroteo. It means to cling desperately or tightly. Like hold on for dear life might be a way we would translate that today. The phrase our confession is really, really important. It literally means to say together. So it doesn't mean only private belief. Holding fast to your confession because Jesus is your high priest doesn't mean that you just convince yourself privately of the things you say you believe. It means to speak them publicly together. This is what the same word Paul uses in Romans 10, 9, and 10 when he says, is, is with our hearts that we believe, but with our mouths we what? Confess. They go together, in other words. Inner belief and public life go together. What you say about Jesus matters. And I think there are too many Christians today in the, in the secret service, if you will. <laughs> Covert Christians. In the right company, where it's safe, oh yes, yes, I believe in Jesus. But we're reticent or hesitant or reserved, cagey about that in other circles. And I understand that in the world that we're living in. But the writer of Hebrews is saying, because of who Jesus is and what he has done and is now doing for you, hold fast your confession. Don't hide. Speak it joyfully, proudly, because of who he is. Not private belief, but public confession. Now these Jews in the first century, were this was, an, this was a real trouble for them. Speaking publicly about their faith in Christ caused them difficulty, hardship. Even put their life in jeopardy. He, G, the writer is saying, why go back to your old reliance on a human priesthood when you have the real thing? Hold fast to your confession. Jesus' job is to be our great high priest and intercede for us. You can bet he has done and is doing his job. Let's do ours. Hold fast to him. Don't be ashamed. Don't be frightened to speak about his love and his grace and his mercy. Not in anger shaking our fist at the world. Not digging in our heels and judging those who don't hold fast to the confession. But in joy of who he is and what he's done for us. Saying, I, I'm with Jesus. I'm with him. There's no question that he's doing his job on our behalf. This brings us to a greater confidence. He's our greater high priest and a greater confidence. We read these words, let us then draw near with confidence. When, when you're struggling or you're in need, when you're hurting, you, you, you really want two things, don't you? When you're going through a hard time, you want someone who understands what you're going through. Don't you want that? And you want someone who can do something about it. You want both, don't you? You don't want somebody who really has no, who, who gives you religious platitudes or they're theirs when they don't really know what you're facing. That's not helpful. You want someone who can sh sit next to you, come alongside you, draw near to you, and who understands at the deepest level what it is you're facing. But you don't just want to wallow in a shared misery or a shared struggle. You want someone who can lift you out of that who can help you. What the writer of Hebrews is saying, that's exactly what you have in Jesus. In verse 15, he is not unable to sympathize. He's been tested in every way as you have. He understands. He knows. He's been through it. No temptation has seized him except that which is common to man. He's been through it. And he's been through that. He's passed through the heavens. He can lift you out of that. He's not bound by those same struggles because he was without sin. That's why that little phrase matters. Tested and attempted in every way that you have been yet without sin. What do you want? Someone to come alongside me who knows what I'm facing. That's Jesus. What do you want? Someone to come alongside me who can lift me out of what I'm facing. That is Jesus, your great high priest. This is our confidence. Hebrews is telling us that in Jesus we have both. Our confidence is not in ourselves, not even in our ability to hold fast to him, but in who he is and what he has done. 
My, my experience as a pastor, as I mentioned at the outset, has taught me that most people are not that confident when it comes to approaching God. We're, we're not, when it comes right down to it. We don't naturally think of approaching or drawing near to God as something that we're confident and excited about. When we were in Israel a couple of years ago, Pastor Brian and Lorene and my wife and I had a wonderful tour there, and we were in Jerusalem for several days of our tour, a couple of days of our tour, uh, and, of course, one of the things to do and that you want to do when you get to J Jerusalem, the holy city, is to go to the Temple Mount. It dominates the landscape. It's this massive platform built by Herod, and it's still there, it's, although it's been, you know, crump, knocked down and rebuilt. And because of the, Israel's modern history, the Six-Day War with their p peace treaty with Jordan and Egypt, they, the Temple Mount is actually controlled by both Israeli security and Jordanian security as well. It's kind of weird. So there's Muslim security and Jewish security there, and when you, you have to walk through this kind of, uh, some of you may have been there, you have to walk up this ramp, and it's like all fenced in. You wait in line, you go through several security checkpoints. You don't, and, and remember, the Temple Mount, on which the temple stood, in which was the, the ancient place of the Holy of Holies, where they don't know exactly where it was, the Dome of the Rock, a Muslim mosque is there now, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the Dome of the Rock, are, is now on that spot, which... Jews suspect the, the actual Holy of Holies was. But it's not a, a secure feeling. This is a picture I took while waiting in line. These are Israeli security officers. Behind them are the Jordanian security officers. When we got up there, there were some Jewish teenagers running around on the Temple Mount, and the Muslims were shouting at them, Allah Akbar, screaming at them. And I, you know, we were just tourists, and, and, and I, was, it was une I felt uneasy. So think about that. We're going to the Temple Mount which was a symbolic representation of the presence of God. In fact, today, Orthodox Jews will not go up there. Do you know why? Out of fear that they might unintentionally tread on the place of the Holy of Holies. That would, they're not allowed to go there. That would be sacrilege. That would be blasphemous. So we're approaching what in the Jewish mind is the holiest place on earth, the presence of God, and it's not secure. You don't have a lot of confidence going through that. And I think some of us in our minds, we think about approaching God that way. Verse 16 tells us to approach the throne of grace with confidence. This phrase, throne of grace, I mentioned to you before, throne of grace, that's the Old Testament tabernacle language. Remember that when they went in the Holy of Holies, only one thing was in there, the Ark of the Covenant. At the top of the Ark of the Covenant were the cherubim's wings, which came together facing inward at a point. And that point, that spot, it's called the mercy seat, sometimes referred to as the throne of grace, the place where the presence of God dwelt. That's the place where the blood was sprinkled. That's the spot, in other words. To the Jewish mind, you can't go there. Have you seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? Your face will melt. I mean, you read about this in, in the Old Testament, people are dropping dead if the ark is mishandled. You can't approach that spot. You can't go in there. Only the high priest can. We, we sew bells on the hem of his garment, so if he gets it wrong, we, he stops jingling, we drag him out. You can't go in there to the presence of God. Nobody can. This is in their minds. Sometimes it's in ours. Maybe not that way, but God makes us nervous. I will often ask men that I'm engaged with in their lives, what do you think God thinks of you? Let me ask you, what do you think God thinks of you? How many of you, if I ask that question, what do you think God thinks of you? Your mind goes to something you are not doing good enough. You think, well, he's patient with me. He's putting up with me. I'm a work in progress. He knows I'm trying. He, you know, you, your mind goes to, yes, he loves me, but. Right? We've all got that in the back of our mind. I'm not certain. I'm not 100% confident where I stand with him. I'm a little uneasy when I think about what God thinks of me. But if I ask you moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, what do you think of your son? What do you think of your daughter? What do you think of your grandson or granddaughter? Talia, what do you think of her? You know? You don't go to, well, she's very naughty, but I still love her. No. You think she's precious to me. I can't put into words what I feel about her. What the writer of Hebrews is saying, let us approach with confidence the throne of grace. It's easy to miss. He's saying, because of how God looks at you through Jesus, you don't have to shudder. You don't have to grovel. You don't have to be nervous or insecure. You can walk right in. 
No Jew would ever conceive of approaching God this way. But our confidence is not in us. It's in who our high priest is. Jesus, the Son of God. He is our confidence. The, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 11 through 12, This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So verse 14 says, hold fast, right? Verse 16 says, draw near. And verse 15 says, because you have a great high priest. Hold fast. How? Because of Jesus. Draw near. Why? Because of Jesus. You can hold fast and you can draw near because of your great high priest, Jesus, the Son of God. God, God's not hard to approach, friends. He's not far off. And this is the last point, a greater access. He's our greater high priest, he's our greater confidence, and he's our greater access. The, the word translated for confidence, which we just talked about, is, is usually translated boldness, courage. It means without fear or fearlessly. Um, and it's appropriate to translate confidence as well. But it actually is often used in the New Testament to mean free in your speech. To speak freely, in other words. Which is interesting. Your access, your, when you come to God, it's not once upon a time to get salvation. It's moment by moment coming into his presence to speak freely. We, you don't have to measure your words with God. I remember years ago when I was a youth pastor, uh, some of the young men that were in our group that I was leading were nervous to pray out loud. And so uh, I just was encouraging them that God's listening to your heart. You, don't have, you can't get it wrong. Just be honest before God. Don't worry about having the right words. And one young man grew up in a very uh, formal uh, conservative tradition where he was afraid to say anything wrong. And so he was nervous to pray out loud. And I was kind of coaching these guys, and we were going to go around the circle and pray. And when it came to his turn, I still remember this, he started three times, apologized three times to God, and said, can I start over? Oh, Lord, okay, let me start over. You know, it's like, like he's apologizing to God in his prayer and starting over because he got it wrong. Now, I appreciate his honesty and his humility, but I, I wanted, I, after I want to tell him, you can't get that wrong. God's not grading your theology. God's not, mm, his syntax and grammar was off, therefore, I will not listen to him. La, 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 la. You know, like, no. God is listening to the honesty of your heart, and you have access. You have access to the heart of God because of your high priest. You don't have to worry about getting the words right. Speak freely. Speak freely. Tell them what's on your heart. When you know that you have a high priest like Jesus, you can come right in with your heart, with your mind, with your words. A slave is not free to speak freely to his or her master. A servant is not free to speak openly to their master or king. A soldier doesn't speak freely unless given permission by their commanding officer. But Jesus tells us, you are my son, you are my daughter. Speak freely. We have a greater access. We are to draw near to God with the confidence of a son or a daughter in Christ. Verse 16 again. Um, Hebrews 4, verse 16. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace and, and help in time of need. When is this? This, we receive mercy and find grace. St. Clair Ferguson, in his commentary on this passage, says, there's not such a thing as grace. Which, if you take that sentence by itself, I'd say, I don't think he's right. He goes on and he says, there's no such substance or quasi-substance called grace apart from the person of Jesus Christ. All there is, is Jesus. Grace is the grace of Jesus. There's nothing that Jesus takes apart from himself and gives to you called grace. When you ask for grace, you're asking for him. You're asking God to give you Jesus. When we pray and ask God to give us mercy and grace, we're asking God to give us Jesus, and he has. Ferguson writes, he has. Then it says, you find this when? In your time of need. Mercy and grace in your time of need. When's that? Well, what it means is, you know, do the best you can on your own, and then if things get really, really bad, call out to Jesus. 
Jesus didn't say when he left this earth, hey, you should be good for now on your own. I've given you everything you need, but you know, call me if you need me. <laughs> no. We are to pray without ceasing. When are, when are you in need of mercy and grace? When are you not in need of mercy and grace? What, what he's saying is we have constant, continual, never-ending, open-door access to the heart of the Father because of our great high priest, Jesus. <laughs> is there better news? Is there better news than this? You have constant, open-door policy. There's no time you're shut out. There's no time that's closed to you. You have constant access to the heart of the Father because of your great high priest, Jesus, the Son of God. Always, continually, it's open to you. Are you accessing that? If you have that, are you accessing that? Hold fast your confession and draw near with confidence. Are we doing that? And one feeds the other, doesn't it? If you're not drawing near, then my guess is you're not holding fast. Access. I told you at the beginning about my, my wife's fear of her paternal grandfather and how it was a misunderstanding because what a kind and loving and wise man he was. She just misunderstood his heart. I think many of us misunderstand the heart of God. I want to give you a little image that hopefully will stay with you as you leave here that I think gets at the heart of God for you, how he wants you to view him and you. Not nervous in a security line, not afraid of grandpa and he might yell at you, but as free like a child to run into the arms of your father. Some of you will recognize the, the image in, in the, on this little snippet here. I love that. That is Evelyn Butler, Evie Butler, and that's Pastor Bob Gray, her grandfather, who, by the way, we should pray for. He has pneumonia and is in the hospital at the moment. But that great-grandfather, excuse me, great-grandfather of Bob Gray. Yes, great. Great high priest, great-grandfather. <laughs> that image. And sometimes the older you get, the, further, the more I, I think we can forget. This is God's heart for you. What the writer of Hebrews is saying amidst all this, this language in the Old Testament is this. You don't have to cower. You don't have to wonder. You don't have to be insecure. You don't have to trust in some other human to do something for you. You, because of your high priest, Jesus Christ, have access to the heart of the Father. And you can go right in. And he welcomes you. He welcomes you. Let's stand together for closing prayer and the benediction. Let's pray. Father God, we pause now and acknowledge that sometimes we ignore, sometimes we forget and sometimes we're just wrong about your heart for us. Thank you for this amazing promise that we have, each of us has, a high priest who intercedes for us, who always lives to make intercession for us. And that because of him, Jesus, we can run right to you, speak freely. Help us to do that, to live each day with this kind of access and to hold fast our confession to our great high priest, Jesus, in his name, we pray. Amen. Now before the benediction and you leave, we wanted to give you a little special treat. Our brothers and sisters who have been worshiping over at the Mill Creek campus wanted to send you their warm greeting on the very first time open to the public. So if we're good, roll it. Good morning, Chapel Street Church. We're so excited to be here together for our inaugural Sunday at our Mill Creek campus. Say hello from Chapel Street Church. <laughs> I don't know if you caught the one guy in the corner who's like, I'm not clapping. <laughs> He's just doing this. So. I, I, I hope you see and recognize and celebrate that that's part of us. Those are your brothers and sisters, and we trust and celebrate what God will do as he expands his kingdom through our efforts to, to honor him. Now go in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is your high priest and always lives to make intercession for you. May you hold fast to your confession in him and draw near because of Jesus. Amen. And go in peace.